Okay, so I am Lisa Marie van der Watt. I am uh, here at the Arctic Research Center at Umeå University, which was established um, two years ago. Uh, and they are actually the hosts of this whole uh, Mistra Arctic program. Um, I just want to say one thing before I begin, is that I cannot nearly take uh, the credit for all the work that went into this. I just quickly want to acknowledge some of the colleagues that uh, helped work, especially on the scenarios, we'll, which you'll hear about more later. Um, okay, so... As you heard from Annika, uh, the Arctic is changing rapidly and in unexpected ways. Moreover, these changes in the Arctic feed back into the Earth system in increasing rates and increasingly unsuspected feedback loops. What happens in the Arctic clearly does not stay in the Arctic and it has global consequences and global resonance. Nor is the Arctic isolated from what happens in the rest of the globe. So let's take Payala as an example. But you may want to ask, uh, or maybe not after you heard Annika speaking, what does a small northern Swedish municipality such as Payala have to do with the Arctic? Is the Arctic not a place of polar bears, icebergs and desolation and adventure? Well, yes, that too. Um, but... The Arctic is also home to four million people, four million people, not four billion, million people. <laughs> and actually about 6,000 of them are registered in Payala municipality, the center of which is about 70 kilometers north of the polar circle, which is one of the many delineations of the Arctic. And here you can see some of the delineations of the Arctic, both scientific, natural scientific, as well as other types of social delineations where the Arctic, are, where the Arctic is. You can also look at it this way. So there up north is Payala municipality. It is approximately 8,000 square kilometers big, which, if you compare it to municipalities in the south, or they're in that very dark little spot where you can't even see the, the area there around Stockholm, it is actually quite a large municipality, but it has the tiniest fraction of Stockholm's population. But if you turn that picture around, like here, um, you could see that these parts of northern Sc Scandinavia and of northern Russia down there, uh, it's actually some of the most densely populated areas in the Arctic. So those circles show the population densities around the Arctic. So in terms of the Arctic, it's, it's quite the urban area. Um, there may not be polar bears close to Payala, but the region have forests that sequester carbon and could provide timber, reindeer that carry economic and cultural significance to the Sami people, snow that provide a winter playground for tourists and athletes. And when I googled a picture of um, Payala and skiing, I only came on pictures of, uh, uh, of Swedish uh, women skiers, so I couldn't find you a nice picture. <laughs> Apparently it's a woman uh, skier called Payala that's really famous. Um, <laughs> So, <laughs> um, so there's not a nice picture of that, but there's other kinds of adventures that you can have in the snow. Um, and they also have mineral resources such as iron ore that can provide jobs and steel. In fact, as many of you might know, Payala was recently very much in the news due to its mineral resources. Founded by Canadians, a Luxembourg domiciled, Canadian and Norwegian traded, Swedish-run iron mine in Payala municipality went from what was supposed to be Payala's golden goose, bringing jobs, people and vitality to the community, to being a major drain on Payala and its residents, uh, and its residents in less than four years. After starting up in record time, the company went bankrupt last year due to both external factors, such as the iron price, but also due to poor management by a number of actors involved, including executives in the company, but also local and regional administrators. 
But Payala also has people, and these people are affected by anthropogenically driven climate change, mostly resulting from activities far south of Payala and south of the Arctic. These changes can impact the forest growing season, and here you can see using one of the um, RCPs, if we do not stop producing the amount of greenhouse gases that we do, how the vegetation period will increase in Norbutten. Um, it can, for example, affect the grazing patterns of reindeer that need to be moved much earlier in the season. It can influence the extent and duration of the winter snow cover with a smaller snow cover of shorter duration that can affect the whole ecosystem. Warmer climates affect the spread of diseases and the spread of some disease vectors change. An increase in freeze and thaw cycles can damage the stability of built infrastructure, even more potholes. It is, however, not just environmental changes, but other global shifts that also affect the Arctic and its small towns. Political decisions and taxation policies devised in southern capitals such as Stockholm and Ottawa affects these towns. When the price of raw materials such as iron ore falls because of slower economic growth in China, and here you can see how drastically it fell, uh, that graph is from 2010 to 2015, and the price is in, 10 f uh, in, in US uh, dollar tons per ton. So when the price of raw materials such as iron ore falls before, because of slow economic growth in China, it can affect the local economies of towns like Payala. So historically, the future of most parts of the Arctic have been defined by actors elsewhere. The policy makers, scientists, multinational companies, environmental NGOs. But towns like Payala are not only places to which things are done to. Increasingly, residents of the region have become recognized as legitimate actors in the development of the North, and they partake in international forums such as Annika, those that Annika referred to in the Arctic Council of the increased permanent participants. Moreover, interest in the Arctic has grown internationally. However, many of these narratives told about the Arctic still mostly refer um, still mostly refer to the Arctic as a uniform space, without acknowledgement of the many different types of very local contexts within the Arctic. Clearly, global climate changes affect the future of the Arctic and of towns such as Payala. And thinking about the future involves thinking about a rapidly changing world in which the local and the global are intimately connected. There is a need to create spaces for dialogue between these local perspectives and experts on global drivers that may affect the Arctic. There is also a need for spaces where different types of knowledge can interact. Scientific experts, local and regional government officials, different members of the community. So a platform is needed for this kind of social learning, where one can learn from one another's perspectives to build a more textured picture of the challenges and opportunities ahead and how to deal with them in a productive, responsible way. As rapid climate change and major geopolitical shifts affect local communities in very complex ways, it is increasingly recognized that we need these kinds of deliberative methods. So one way to think about this, um, and actually I should have shown this picture earlier when I spoke about China. So Payala is a lot closer to China than you think. And you can see that that uh, one board that shows down shows to China and there's one to Texas. Um, and of course, uh, you know how we've all been told as children that if you dig a hole and you go right down, then you will get to China. And China is obviously very close to Payala in many different ways. Um, so in any case, so what we try to do, uh, one platform that we do is, and some of you will be familiar with this, workshops. We love workshops. Workshops involving a variety of actors, creating narratives of potential futures that we can use for, for assessing both knowledge needs and different policy options. So, for the rest of this talk, I will look at one specific method that we used, a bottom-up participatory scenario process that we tested at a workshop we held in Payala uh, from 9 to 10 March uh, 2015. 
Um, and this workshop, just to give you the context, was sponsored by this program, but also part of larger governance type projects. So what are scenarios? Um, scenario methods are, straight, are frequently used in decision-making uh, situations when uncertainties are high, as Annika demonstrated it is in the case of climate change. But it's still necessary to form a long-term view. We cannot simply say, okay, we don't know what will happen, it is uncertain, so we're not going to do anything. That is not a solution. Um, scenarios come in many different forms, but the process is usually organized in relation to the main questions that one asks of the future. So you have something like predictive scenarios, which ask what will happen. And normative scenarios that ask how can a specific target be reached. We focused on explorative scenarios, uh, which ask um, what can happen, what is the possibilities. And they are usually constructed to explore a range of diverse but plausible development pathways. This is especially beneficial when one needs to assess the usefulness of actions or decisions in conditions where uncertainty is inherent, where you cannot escape from uncertainty, where there's not enough, uh, you do not know enough about the variables to predict an outcome. So the climate change community has used scenarios in different ways, and Annika has alluded to some of them both in order to better understand how greenhouse gas emissions may develop in the future, to assess local climate impacts of climate change and as a tool for adaptation planning. And there is currently an ongoing effort to create a scenario process that combines assessing the possible future emission of greenhouse gases, these so-called representative, representative concentration pathways, um, which we used in the latest IPCC report, and storylines of global and social development, which are socioeconomic pathways. So far, however, most of the climate change scenario work have been done by experts and focused on the global picture. There are some uh, that try to downscale these to regional level, um, and a lot of it is based on very solid scientific research, such as trajectories of climate change. But there are also subjective interpretations of how different trends may interact with one another. And it is in this context we sought to involve a more diverse expertise, including local actors in building explorative scenarios. So the method we use, and I'll go through very quickly with this, um, involved, amongst other things, lots and lots and lots of sticky notes. There was about half experts and half practitioners at this workshop. To give you a very quick and simplified overview of how we worked, and remember, we interacted with different actors all the time, I will quickly take you through the process. We identified a focus question. What future changes may influence this region economically, environmentally and socially within the perspective of one or two generations? And using a brainstorming process, we identified drivers or factors that can influence this change. These could range from things such as technological development, an aging population, climate change or taxation policies or international geopolitical tensions like a big note with Russia on it. We then proceeded to cluster the drivers, grouping together factors that were related, example, under climate change, demography or international security. So, if you're still with me, following this, we prioritized the clusters, ranking them from most to least uncertain and most to least important. So what we ended up with was a graph like this incredibly mathematically correct. Um, it, before it became that, it looked like this. So you see what I mean with sticky notes? <laughs> um, okay, so this is what the graph looked like in the end. Clearly, one of the most important things was climate change. It was also one of the more uncertain. One of the most uncertain things at this point was international security. And then other things like, for example, technology ended up, even though it was one of the top things we prioritized, it ended up sort of a bit off graph. 
as not that important, but quite uncertain because we don't know what human technology can bring. I mean, who would have known what could happen even in the less than 10 years that social media has been part of our lives. So, what we did with this is we used a few global shared socioeconomic pathway scenarios, those SSPs I referred to before, and then divided into groups to think about how these different clusters, such as international security or the resource market or technological factors, would look like in each of the worlds sketched by these global scenarios. Um, and the sketches involved about the next 30 years. So when you think about 30 years, that's not very far away. I mean, that is a time when most of you here would still be of working age. Uh, you um, might be at the height of your career, but you will still likely be around. Uh, so this is our world. Again, these worlds are, and I'll go through them very quickly, um, there's the sustainability, taking the green world, road world, uh, which is more inclusive development and improved management of the global commons, low population growth, um, slower economic development, flexible uh, national and regional institutions. Fossil fuel development, which um, is competitive markets, innovation and lots of participatory societies, intensive fossil fuel development, high energy demand and focus on social capital. Uh, it's important to remember that these worlds are inherently coherent. I mean, they, they actually make sense and they are realistic inherently. We're not making science fiction worlds here. And you could be able to actually recognize some of these worlds, I think, in some countries today. Inequality, road divided, increasing inequalities across and within countries, power concentration with a very small elite, moderate but highly unequal economic growth, volatile global market. And then there's regional rivalry, research and nationalism, highly regulated economies, authoritarian governments, slow economic development but high material consumption. So we asked the groups to build scenarios specific to how these worlds would look like in the Payala region, with its concerns, its culture, its economic sectors and national resources. Because these worlds will differ. I mean, they will differ from whether you're in Iqaluit in Canada, in Kirovsk in Russia or other small Arctic towns. So what did these scenarios look like that we built? How did they differ from global scenarios? So in the scenario of sustainability taking the green road, Payala sees an increase in population, even though the global population growth is very slow, um, is very low, because more people opt to live outside urban areas. Cities are less important. It is self-sufficient on energy and has an expanding forestry industry. It is also perhaps a world that emerged from some kind of incredibly major natural disaster that forced a sea change in politics towards a greener economy. In the intensive fossil fuel world, climate change is increasingly rapid and climate change in the Arctic continues to be at twice to happen at double the pace, literally twice the pace than elsewhere. Climate change forces some people, like reindeer herders, to completely change their livelihoods. But on the other hand, the demand on energy resources is a boom for Payala, where the mines reopen and factories move to and factories move there because of cheap energy. It is a highly technologically sophisticated society, and while geoengineering, literally engineering the climate system, may be used on a global scale, its relevance on a local scale is highly uncertain. Road divided an influx of climate change migrants and of tourists looking for the lost wilderness. The mine reopens, but decisions around it are made by national and international elites in governments and companies with no local loyalty. While in general terms the economy is growing strongly, there are increased tensions between the classes, between newcomers and those who have been there, those with loyalty to Payala and those without. Lastly, in regional rivalry, the rocky road, nationalism is resurgent and it can affect both technical innovation and market flows. The authority of the nation state is reinforced to the detriment of global and international efforts. 
For Payala, the ideological shift exacerbates some of the political and economic tendencies that are visible already. The state continues to withdraw from a variety of public sectors, gradually re pushing the responsibility for welfare state functions over to municipalities, but without giving them the money for it. So what I presented here are mere highlights, and the full report will be published later um, in May. But there is still much to be learned. I would like, in conclusion, however, to address one last question. Why does the view from Payala matter? Why do their future narratives matter in this big world where you talk about players such as Russia? Well, the fact that futures and scenarios can be used by various actors as tools to push their particular visions of what the future should ideally look like, that raises questions about who has the power to partake in these narratives, who has the power to have a say and to construct different futures. So in relation to responding to future challenges, there is a need to reflect on how we make stories, on how we create and build and construct ideas about the future, and how those stories determine our understanding and adaptation in practice. How risks are defined, who, who has the authority and the legitimacy to be actors helping to build these fu uh, futures, and who has a choice over what range of policy options can be considered. But the stories themselves can also play a role in creating conditions that favour decision making and that is adaptive to changing conditions, because it goes beyond producing just data but also engages with the kind of emotions that can facilitate public engagement. Thank you.